ask some questions because we're celebrating uh, the Feast of the Annunciation, which normally is on March 25th. Why are we celebrating now on April 8th? And the reason was because it was in the middle of Lent. And sometimes the church in the middle of Lent, like especially on Friday, will transfer the feast. And so that's what happened this year. But it doesn't matter because what we're we doing is we're celebrating a most momentous moment of our faith. This is the dawning of our salvation. This is the moment we heard in the gospel, in the first chapter of the gospel book. This is the moment that all humanity, from all time, but especially those who lived in time, were waiting for. The birth of the Savior. All the longing in the human heart. And it comes in this great moment when the angel Gabriel sent by God. The name of Gabriel means God's strength sent to God to, to announce this most extraordinary thing that the Son of God would come now to take on human nature, the very thing that caused the whole wreckage of sin and the human and human nature, now comes to take on human nature to save all humanity for all time. And yet it's hinging, as we well know, on, on this wonderful, wonderful maiden, the Virgin of Nazareth named Mary. And how we want to celebrate her today as well, because what great courage, what great humility, what great faith she had in that simple response. Not because she could understand it, hardly who could wrap their mind around this incredible mystery that's being told her, but she accepted it on the Word of God, given by an angel. And she said, yes, let it be done to me according to your Word. I am the handmaid of God. This great moment that we, we celebrate not just once a year, but you know, when we pray our rosary, we celebrate it at least twice a, a week in the great joyful mystery. This wonderful moment. And it's been depicted because it's so beautiful. We depict it in so much of art and mosaics and stained glass. My favorite picture of this moment is uh, Fra Angelicus. If you ever get a chance, by God's blessing, we go to Florence. Never miss the Museo de San Marco, which is right across the plaza. You're standing in the front door of the academy where Michelangelo's great David is located, along with a lot of other statues of Michelangelo. Beeline about this direction, across the little plaza, there's a, the monastery of San Marco. And that's where Fra Angelica lived, and he doodled on the walls all his beautiful paintings. Every cell has a by Frangelica. Beautiful. But as you go from the first floor up to the second floor, you come up the top of the steps, and there is the Annunciation. That beautiful picture of the angel with multicolored wings announcing this great moment of salvation to, to the world. Uh, unbelievable. But you know, our, our, our celebration of this feast doesn't stop with this great moment. That in itself is enough for us rejoicing, but what does this moment also proclaim to the world? It's this, brothers and sisters. That God became a man. He was incarnate. It's called the mystery of the incarnation. Now that will not happen again in history. The Son of God became man once for all, and by his death and resurrection is redeemed all. But the fact of the matter is the angel was not only announcing that, but God, he was announcing the reality of one of the great principles of our Catholic faith, which I call is the incarnational principle. It's one of those fundamental principles upon which all Catholic faith is founded. The first one is that we believe that all revelation is, comes from the Holy Spirit, not the Bible. All revealed truth comes from the Holy Spirit. Some of it is written in the Bible. But the Holy Spirit didn't speak just through the inspired word of Scripture. The Holy Spirit spoke in many ways. It speaks most powerfully through the magisterium, the infallible voice of the church. It speaks in the sacred tradition that revealed. Remember, the Holy Spirit revealed the truth of the apostles. Some was written down in that scripture. The others passed down its called tradition, capital T. Under the guidance of the magisterium of the church that preaches, proclaims, preserves this truth so that all of us can hear the good news, come to faith and be saved. You see, that's the first principle. The second principle would be the hierarchy of truth. And our truth is built 
like a building. There's foundational truths, and then everything's built upon that. Just like a, a, you see a beautiful church building. Everything you make, the, everything's part of this beauty. But what's the most fundamental part is the foundation. And, and, and the superstructure between it, huh, that holds everything up. It's nice to have the station, but it's not as fundamental as the flooring and the girders and the girders that go across the whole roof. And that's what our faith says. There's certain foundational, basic, fundamental truths from which everything else it hates. But the fact matters, all things are beautiful. We don't throw out something, you can see. Our devotion to saints. It's not fundamental. It's not as fundamental as a belief in God, His Father, Son, and Spirit, the Trinity, or a belief in the Incarnation. But it's part of this great mystery. That's why we keep it, preserve it, and celebrate it. The third principle is what we celebrate today. It's called the Incarnational Principle. And that's this. That God ordinarily works through his created reality, through creation, the sum of which is human beings. He's not limited to it. God can work in any way he does, but can, and desires. He can work mysteriously. We've seen how people who are not even of faith come to faith or have great miracles happen like you. God's not limited to that. But he ordinarily works through created reality, the sum of which, and the sum of which is Human being, he ordinarily works to human beings. That's why, for example, we come in the church. We believe in such things as sacramentals. That the very thing about the, the baptismal water, placing those holy water fountains, you dip your hand in and you bless yourself in the sign of the cross with holy water, remember your baptism, to renew yourself in that. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Huh? Not brushing away flies. <laughs> Bless yourself. Remember what brought me into this great community of faith, of sacramental. More fundamental would be the sacraments. Those visible signs that Jesus left his church say, but we celebrate these things, we believe that God's power, guaranteed power, comes to us in such a profound way that the forgiving Jesus his forgiveness continues through that great sacrament of reconciliation or confession. That the healing of Jesus continues in the church through the great sacrament of the anointing of the sin. And especially that the risen Savior, who died on the cross and rose, he comes to us every day in the Holy Eucharist, where bread and wine becomes his body and blood. And in celebrating this, we make present the one moment of salvation. See, he works through these things. Not limited to it, but he works ordinarily in a guaranteed way. And, brothers and sisters, he continues his work most wonderfully, most ordinarily. How else? Through us. The body of Christ, the church, of course. He means to work in me. And, and it's the same process by which it happened to Mary. That's why you want to pay attention to the word. God came to Mary. You're going to be the mother of the Savior. You're going to give birth to the Savior. You're going to give the Son of God human nature. And she asks, how can this be? And we ask the same thing. God says, you're going to be my instrument of great grace and miracles of the world. What? Me? How can that be? I'm, I'm weak. I'm older. I'm a sinner. I'm uh, not very educated. And, and what does the angel say? Ah, oh, Mary. Though you have not known man, it's not going to be by man's effort. It's not your turn. It's what God's going to first do to you. It's the Holy Spirit that will come upon you. If you accept the Holy Spirit, it will act through you, use you. And God will take flesh and work through you. And at that moment, Mary says, yes. And that's what God is waiting for you and me is his body. To say, yes, God. I'm pretty limited. I'm not moving as fast as I did before. I'm not that smart. I'm not that holy, but if you want me and you want to use me, I am the servant or hand me the Lord, and it be done to me in the power of your spirit and the power of your work. That's what God's waiting for. And that's why this feast is so wonderful. We look back in time to that great moment when the Son of God became man, conceived by the power of the Spirit, was born of the Mary to be our Savior. But we also look here and we look to the future. God in this
this Annunciation announces the Incarnation Principle. He wants to use the things of this world to be communicate His grace, but especially us to be His instruments, so that we too now can say that God means to take my human nature and work His miracle of saving grace out there. And I just have to be as disposed, as faithful, as courageous as our dear Blessed Mother Mary would say, and let it be done. Don't know how it's going to happen, but let it be done. Amen. Amen. Amen.